This problem of payments from a distance was overcome by the use of bills of exchange. A bill of exchange was a signed order from the payer to an addressee demanding that the addressee pay a certain specified sum of money to the person identified as the payee. These were secured by signature and they could not be acted upon in court by anyone other than the original parties. Thus they were of no use to a thief or any other third party. You probably recognize that these were the precursors of checks. I, the payer, instruct the bank, the addressee, to pay the payee, a person named on the check, a certain sum of money. This was all well and good for transactions among parties who were known to each other. The bill of exchange was used merely as a way to order payment in coin at a distant location. But merchants soon wanted more flexibility. They wanted to be able to use bills of exchange to reconcile payments amongst many merchants in many locations using bills of exchange like money itself. For this to work, bills of exchange had to be assignable to and enforceable by third parties. As we shall see, this was the moment in legal history that gave sanction to the banking system we have today. A third party who might have honestly purchased a bill of exchange several steps removed from the original exchange could not be expected, nor would he have the right, to show up in a common law court and defend the validity of the contract and collect on it. This made third party bills of exchange an unacceptable risk. So, in order to be able to use bills of exchange as a convenient and guaranteed third party payment system, essentially equivalent to money, the common law practice had to be set aside regarding bills of exchange. In England, by a series of legal decisions from 1664 to 1699, this problem for commerce was remedied by making bills of exchange enforceable by third parties. If a third party had purchased a bill for valuable consideration and in good faith, having no apparent reason to suspect fraud or some deficiency in the right of the seller to sell it, then the bill automatically became good and enforceable by the court against the signer. What did this change mean? It meant, essentially, that any bill of exchange would be considered legitimate once it was sold. Bills of exchange and all other subsequent types of signed promises to pay, with the notable exception of checks, became transferable and enforceable in court, just what the merchants wanted. Now debt contracts could be sold like things, and transacting business would be a whole lot easier. Not only that, it opened up a whole new market for profit seekers, trading in bills of exchange themselves. The marketing of debt was born. The change in the law had another effect as well. It made it possible to trick or even force a person into signing a legally binding promise to pay and then, if that promise were purchased by a third party for real consideration and in good faith, it would be enforceable against the signer in court. Ultimately, this became one of the foundational principles of the Uniform Commercial Code, which governs the conduct of business in the United States, and by extension, in most of the world. Think about it. If we buy a stolen laptop from a guy on the street, we're guilty of receiving stolen goods, a criminal offense doesn't matter if we paid honest money and were unaware the goods were stolen. The court will restore the goods to the rightful owner. We, as purchasers, innocent or not, lose our money and may even be charged with a crime. But if we buy a loan contract from a banker and give him real value for it in good faith, it doesn't matter that the loan contract may have come into existence under false pretenses. Whoever signed it is required by commercial contract law to pay up and the courts will enforce the obligation. Today, debt contracts come in a myriad of forms, including and especially loans and mortgages. It's significant to note that just as these common law restrictions were being removed, the brand new Bank of England was being established. 
the first bank state authorized to create money out of thin air. The new laws fit in perfectly, making the new bank's empty contracts enforceable against the so-called borrower. Those who have discovered the true nature of their own bank loans and have attempted to challenge the validity of their debt contracts in modern courts have discovered to their dismay that this commercial contract law is still the bedrock defense of money as debt. The bank will have sold the original loan agreement to a third party for value and even though that third party is often just a sister company of the bank, all that matters to the judge is who possesses the document, what it says and whose signature is on it. The bank's failure to inform the borrower about the true nature of the loan contract and the absence of any actual money loaned on the bank's part is not relevant. So, to conclude our investigation, it appears that modern banking practice rests on several distinct violations of common law, common sense, and natural justice. The first violation is the fraud the borrower commits by pledging as collateral property the borrower does not yet own. And the bank is complicit as it knowingly accepts the fraudulent pledge as backing for the credit it creates. The second violation is the failure of the bank to disclose the true nature of the contract. The bank calls it a loan, leading the borrower to believe that he or she is receiving a loan of existing money. But the bank knows full well it has provided only a brand new promise to pay simply typed in on a computer screen. A promise that the bank knows it will probably never have to fulfill. Thirdly, the loan agreement should be invalid because impossible contracts are legally invalid. The bank is creating an impossible contract because the conditions required to guarantee that the borrowers have the opportunity to pay off the principal plus interest are not met. Unless the system enforces a hundred percent recycling of both principal and interest, which it emphatically does not, some borrowers are going to default and lose their collateral simply due to the systemic shortage of money. The fourth violation is the violation of natural law by the law of contracts, which confers automatic legitimacy of title on any contract if the contract is sold to a third party for valuable consideration. This violates the principle that one cannot give better title to something than one has. But perhaps the biggest fraud of all is that most of the people who produce the real wealth of the world are in debt and at risk of losing everything they have worked for to bankers who fabricate money out of mere promises to pay. And where does this leave us? We are hostages in an economy that must grow faster and faster to keep up with an ever-growing money supply where the entire system collapses in ruin. The money system is currently structured refuses to recognize that the real economy is limited by the capacity of the planet to provide the raw materials and waste disposal services the economy needs. The planet is finite and therefore it should be obvious that the economy cannot grow at an accelerating pace forever. Our current money system runs like the bus in the movie Speed. It could not slow down or the bomb planted on the bus would go off. And our situation is even worse because the rate of debt creation must forever accelerate or the entire economy crashes. The notion that infinite, perpetually accelerating growth is possible is the great fallacy of modern economics. It is a fatal delusion born of greed. An economic, social and environmental crash of unprecedented proportion is surely inevitable and this monetary system is utterly and hopelessly incapable of adapting to it. No wonder monetary reformers around the world insist that the entire monetary system needs to be rebuilt from the ground
So what is the solution? One idea many people suggest is to return to the days when money was backed by gold. Gold, they argue, is the true money because it's inherently valuable. The underlying principle here is that money should be a commodity that is valuable due to its scarcity, as gold is scarce. As a general rule, those who hold this view of money also believe that money should exist independent of government. Another school of thought, diametrically opposite, is that the creation of money should be the exclusive prerogative of governments. Government, which represents all the people, should spend money into existence in the public interest, thus backing the currency with what it was spent on. Having taken back the power to simply spend money into existence, government would never need to go into debt or pay interest. Of course, government spending without limit would result in a worthless currency. To prevent inflation, money would also have to be extinguished. This could be accomplished using a wide variety of taxes, resource royalties, and user fees. Government spending and government taxes would, therefore, be interdependent and would equal each other in a perfect equilibrium. However, the goal of taxation would be to achieve price stability, as the government would have no need of tax revenues in order to operate. 